Dr. Vinay Prasad here from the University of California, San Francisco. By request, I'm going to talk about that science paper everyone's been buzzing about. This is where they took metastatic melanoma patients who had progressed on PD-1 or pd one therapy. They reintroduced nivolumab, but topped it off with a fecal transplant, and they got 30% response rate, and everyone was celebrating. This is the power of the microbiome, and we're finally harnessing it. Well, are we? I took a look at this paper, and let me show you what I found about it. Here it is, of course, science, the creme de la creme of the biomedical literature. But don't think about that because this is fecal microbiota transplant, promoting response and immunotherapy refractory melanoma patients. What do you need to know about this? You need to know that PDL1 and PD1 drugs are used in metastatic melanoma. There's a fraction of people with long term durable response. And probably of all the tumor types, the responders in this malignancy we know the most about, and we know that there's a certain durability. Whether or not that applies to everything equally, it's a bit of a question mark. But here we do know there is a fraction, long-term durable responders. Well, not those people entered this study. In other words, people who had progressed on checkpoint inhibitor therapy entered this study. They progressed on PD-1 therapy. And in this study, they took stool from two patients who were complete responders with a fairly decent PFS. And they took their stool and they transplanted it in 10 people who did not achieve response to PD-1 therapy initially, and they washed it down with some nivolumab, and they looked to see what the response rate was. And lo and behold, it was 30%. And that made people really excited that fecal transplant might be able to unlock the immune system in some way we don't know. And maybe that all those millions of dollars of investment in sequencing this stool was not for naught. Well, here's the problem with it. Um, I'll hold off on the problem for a second and give you one more bit of background. I mean, I don't think people fully appreciate, but the market share of these checkpoint inhibitor drugs is massive. I mean, pembrolizumab is uh, on track to hit $100 billion cumulative revenue long before anything else ever did. Um, this is a paper that Allison Haslam and I did where we just sought to estimate the upper bound of the percent of US cancer patients who are eligible for checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And so what we did is we looked at all the checkpoint inhibitor approvals and boy, there were a lot of them. And here's what we found. We found that if this vertical bar represents every US cancer patient who might otherwise have died of cancer in the year 2018, we found that about 43% of US cancer patients were eligible. Melanoma, of which immunotherapy is best known and maybe even and first brought to market in, um, it's only about 1% of all cancer deaths. So it doesn't account for the lion's share of their revenue. That is lung cancer, my friend. Lung cancer is much more common. And the PD-1 and pd one drugs are cleaning up in the lung cancer business. It also has uh, use in all these other malignancies. Uh, Merkel cell, you know, that's not exactly the largest market share. Uh, but uh, HCC with the Tezobev, you know, they have, uh, they have quite some market share there. So 43% are eligible. Let me show you one more figure so you get some sense of this. Um, you know, the, 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 the short graph, the bottom graph, this is the uptake, the blue line shows the uptake of genome targeted drugs over the last uh, 15, 20 years. If you plot it out to 2020, like we did in an annals of oncology paper, it's right on that line. We've had modest uptake. We're, we're close to, you know, 10% of all US cancer patients are eligible for a genome targeted drug. But look at checkpoint inhibitors. 2011 to 2014, we just had IPI, melanoma, and then boom, we had PD1 in non small cell lung cancer, and we got small cell and HCC, et cetera, et cetera. And here's the Merkel and the PMBL at the tip of it. Um, it's brought the market share up to about 40% of US cancer patients. Now, of course, this assumes everyone can afford the drugs and has access to assumptions that aren't true in this cruel and horrible US marketplace. However, this is the lay of the land. So back to the paper. The paper basically took those 10 people who had progressed on PD-1 therapy. It gave them some period of time. I think it was like 90 days. They made them swallow a fistful of antibiotics. I think Vank and Neomycin, something nasty to quote, clean out their gut flora. And then they transplanted the stool of these two responders into them. And then they washed it down with six cycles of nivolumab. And here's what they found. Three out of 10 people all who happened to have gotten the stool from donor one, thank you very much, they had, according to the spider plot, a response. I actually, now that I look at it, I wonder if number seven actually meets resist 1.1 responder criteria because that requires two measurements below 30%, not just one. Um, but R5, but patient five and patient three clearly do. So those are responders. Well, the first question you would have is, well, what would have happened to these people if they didn't get the fecal transplant and just got nivolumab again? What would have happened to them? What would their response rate been? And I'll promise you, it's not 0%. 
reintroducing active drugs in malignancy in cohorts of people that enroll in clinical trials where there's a lot of delays along the way, there's going to be a fraction of people who are once again susceptible to that drug. It's true of any drug. It's also true of immunotherapy drugs. So what would the response rate have been? Well, if you were a real scientist, you would randomize patients because that would give you the cleanest signal. And I think someday we might see that, but I would have randomized right up front and early because I want to know the answer very quick. Otherwise, I'm chasing, I'm chasing a ghost with fecal transplant. Uh, quite an unpleasant ghost, if you ask me, um, but you're chasing it. And here's what they did. They actually, in their own paper, they talk about uh, that they did a little bit of a literature search to look to see what the response rate would have been. And here's what they find. They find some paper by Betoff Warner et al. And they report that the response rates of metastatic melanoma patients who were reintroduced with anti-PD-1 monotherapy were five out of 34 or less than 15%. And then they make up some reason why they think that's an overestimate. So I thought to myself, wow, it was only gonna be less than 15%. By the way, less than 15% here is I think 14%, which is really kind of 15%. But you got 30%, three out of 10. Is that enough to hang your hat on? Well, I have my doubts, but I decided to take a little bit more of a look. So I pulled up the Badoff Warner paper. Here it is, long-term outcomes and responses. And indeed, in the abstract, they, they pull out that fact. Response with reintroduction of PD-1 drugs was seen in five out of 34 retreated patients with single agent anti-PD-1 therapy. So that's the percent they're giving. But you know what else I did? I actually read the paper. And would you believe that in the discussion, they had written more about this topic? And let me read it to you. When considering treatment discontinuation, patients often inquire about resuming anti-PD-1 therapy if their disease were to progress in the future. Of course they do. It's a natural question. Data regarding outcomes of patients with melanoma who receive a second course of PD-1 are scarce. But here are three data points. One, Keynote 006, eight people with initial CR were treated with a second course, and four had PR or CR. Hamid, four patients were treated with a second course. All four had CR, but one had tumor shrinkage in response to treatment. Um, all four had CR initially, and only one with reintroduction had response. And then finally, a cohort of 19 people where six people responded. So let me put those numbers here. Four out of eight, 50%. One out of four, 25%. Six out of 19, 32%. And what does the science paper celebrating? Three out of 10, 30%. It's all in the same ballpark, people. It's all in the same ballpark. This science paper, what, this is ridiculous. The first question any reasonable person would ask is what would have the response rate been if you just gave the nivolumab and didn't do the fecal transplant and you haven't even done a cursory literature search to show that you're more or less in the same ballpark. Do I think you're higher? No. Do I think you're lower? Not necessarily. These are super small numbers. I have no clue. You need a much bigger sample size. You need to randomize before you make any such claim. Now you can sequence all the stool you want. And I know you did. And I found changes in patterns of stool, blah, 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 blah. I don't care. I want to see that by doing this thing, you actually increase the response rate over what otherwise would have been. And that's a very simple study randomized control trial. Come on. It's not that hard to do. Why can't we randomize? Why are we celebrating this result? We haven't even tested the scientific question of whether fecal transplant augments this or not. We have no clue. And three out of 10 responders, that's meaningless when I've shown you at least four case series where it's in roughly the same ballpark. This is a joke. I'm really surprised by it, actually. The authors of this paper, they have more time to think about this topic than I do. Surely they would have read all of the other prior reports and they would have known that three out of 10 is roughly in the same ballpark. I find it hard to believe. What am I to think when they don't report that in their manuscript? What am I to think of the editor process in science? So focused on basic science, it misses the forest for the trees. The forest is, well, what would the response rate have been? And you can look that up. And in fact, you kind of need to bolster that with, with more data. So what should a future study look like? Well, a randomized control trial of reintroduction of PD-1 drugs, and one arm gets a fecal transplant too. You can get whoever stool you wish. And the other arm, you can do a, a sham fecal transplant, I suppose. You can give them back their own stool. Um, maybe you have a third arm where you don't do a fecal transplant at all. Um, maybe you have one arm where you just do a fecal transplant, you don't give the PD-1 drug. I will promise you that response rate is probably gonna be close to zero. That's what I would bet. And if I were to bet on this field, I suspect that if you actually did a really large, robust, randomized trial anywhere in oncology, you can pick any drug, you can pick any transplant, you can pick anything you want, and you randomize a thousand people to whatever you do in oncology that actually benefits them, plus or minus fecal transplant, I would find it very hard to believe that fecal transplant actually improves outcomes in anything. And if it does, 
it'll probably do so about five out of a hundred times because that's the nominally significant p-value you're going to pick. Um, anyway, I mean, I, I'm, I'm skeptical that all it took was a little bit of stool after a fistful of vancomycin and neomycin. And I certainly think this paper, it doesn't prove, pardon, pardon the pun, doesn't prove shit. And that's it, it really doesn't. And I have no idea why it's in science. And I have no idea why anyone cares about it. And I have no idea why there's not more people pointing out the fact that there's gotta be some response rate if you just gave the nivolumab. And what does the fecal transplant add? And that is the question. So on that positive note, this is, uh, this is the end of this video. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe to the channel, give us a comment or a like, and listen to Planner Session Podcast for more similar insights.